So as pastor, I have the opportunity, is that on? As pastor, I have the opportunity to talk to a lot of people, both in this community of faith and in the greater community. And one of the most common questions or variants of questions is the one that Paul Coleman asked. Is that it? Is, it, is this all that life has to offer? What I have experienced, what I'm experiencing now in my job, in my marriage, in my life, and the different things that I have going, is, is, is this it? Is this, is this all that life has to offer? Because I've done what the world told me to do. I've done the things that I'm supposed to do. I've bought the right things. I've acquired the right stuff. I've gotten a relationship. I've done this. I've done that. I've done everything the world has told me to do, and I just feel nothing. Is that it? Is that what this world is about? Because there's got to be something more than this. There's got to be something more than this. I've, I've felt this way. Even when I was a senior executive in corporate America, you know, eight years ago, people who worked for me or people who worked around me would have these same questions, and I started to have these same questions too. And it really wasn't until I became the pastor of this particular church that I finally got to that place where I'm like, I feel like I've gotten past that, is this it? I don't know who among you feel this way or have ever felt this way or are feeling this way right now or who of you who are out there feel this way, but you are not alone. Because doing everything that the world tells you to do that makes up a good life is going to leave you wondering, is this it? And the question is, is there something more, as Paul Cohen said, there's got to be something more, and the good news is this. There is. There is. And it's not hard to get. And it's not hidden. And it's not a secret. So let's dig into what the gospel has to say to us today and see what we may be able to find out that will help us with that question, as we start this three-part series called Gratitude You Can Use. Gratitude You Can Use, and this one is, this first one is called, Is That It? And you heard the reading the first time, as my uh, lovely wife, the Dr. Linda Fisher, uh, read there. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. That can also be translated as, do not store your treasures in the earth, and we'll talk about why that's important in a minute, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. All right, so I know I'm not the greatest artist in the world, but, I, but what is this? A barn, right? A barn. And so these, these are kind of familiar in New England in particular and in Connecticut as well because of the whole tobacco history and using this color to, you know, using this color to paint. But this here is symbolizing things where we're just storing things up. Like storing and storing and storing things up. And we may have big boxes. And Linda's going to look at me and smile at least sarcastically because I talk about these extra boxes and I have a lot of these extra boxes. I have a lot of these extra boxes. See, their head's going up and down. I, see, I, look, I don't pretend I've got this all right. All these extra boxes, you know what sometimes happens? Go into one of these extra boxes, and what's happened to the stuff inside of it? It's rotten. Things just open the boxes, and like moths fly out. Old sweaters have holes in them. Old newspapers that were given to me by like my father that were from his history and different things, and they've fallen apart. She's, she can't, she's about to cackle. Right? But when we store up in these, moths literally can get in there and consume and get rid of those things that we think are so precious and storing. And then you get these big containers and put food in them and you get it from Costco and it's for like a year's worth and you think you've saved money and you've used like 5% of it and then the rats get in it. 
right? And the rats get in and they start chewing on the edges of the plastic or whatever else you've, they're contained in and they start to get at it. And then inside, whole huge barn, it can represent whatever you want. It can represent your bank account. It can represent whatever you want. But we store things and store things and store things and store things. But over time, these things erode in value not necessarily financial value, but they erode in value to your life. Because one of the things I have found most in people is as their financial wealth goes up, it becomes less meaningful to them. You know how you know that? Because they need more to feel what they felt before. Because what's been saved up is no longer adequate, and it becomes decayed in value, even though it hasn't lost anything in the stock market. Now over here, here, it's the other thing where I said, where it says, don't just take your treasures on earth, but also in the earth, because back then a lot of the people took their treasure, particularly if they were poor, whatever they had, and they would just dig a hole because they had dirt floors in their houses. And they would dig a hole in there and put the stuff, and then put the ground over, and the thieves knew that the poor people did this, and so thieves would come to the poor people's homes and dig up when they were gone into the the ground of their homes to dig up that treasure, which is where the thieves would go and get that treasure for the most point. And then we won't have one of those Bible power words that we talk about in Bible study. What is it? But, right, so but, and then, those are power words in the Bible. So going from 19 to 20, it says, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So basically, this kind of sounds like and this is how this is mostly mistranslated and mispreached about. Don't store up stuff here. Just do a lot of good in the world because then you can build up and have like a barn in heaven. Right? And you've got this barn and you're filling up this barn or this bank account in heaven. And if you save up enough stuff there, you'll have enough to buy a ticket into the golden gates, the pearly gates to get into heaven. So you just take care of yourself and put money in that barn in heaven and you'll be able to buy in. That's how that's mostly preached on. Does that sound like Jesus? I don't think so. This passage has nothing to do with how to get into the afterlife. This passage has nothing to do with getting into a heaven that is out there. It has everything to do with building heaven here. How many of you have heard me talk about the kingdom of God before? Right, like everybody. If you've ever been here, right, if you've ever been here all the time, the kingdom of God, for those of you who, uh, who haven't heard this or aren't aware, is the single biggest principle and mission of Jesus's life. Jesus was here for the purpose of building the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. And that gives context to this passage. Because even though this is saying heaven, in Matthew, Matthew uses the term heaven or kingdom of heaven as a replacement and substitute for the kingdom of God. So Mark and Luke use the term the kingdom of God. When Matthew says the kingdom of heaven, he means the exact same thing, the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of heaven is that which Jesus was his primary mission to come and build the kingdom of heaven here on earth. How do we know this? And how do we know that this makes any sense at all? And I'm not just making it up. Well, in this very same chapter, you just back up a little bit. And there's the Lord's Prayer. Pray this way. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We just prayed this prayer together not that long ago. Bring the kingdom of God from heaven to earth. 
And so Jesus isn't talking about how we can save all this stuff in our bank account in heaven to buy ourselves into heaven. It is to use it differently to build things here on earth, to build that kingdom right here. It is about you and where your heart is. It is about you and your heart in this world today, not tomorrow, not a thousand years from now, not for eternity, but you, your heart, and how that is going to impact the world today. So here's the challenge for us as people. The problem is that sometimes our spiritual life and the way we are biologically put together don't sync together very well sometimes. Now this, in case you're wondering, maybe some of you have actually know what this is, but what, if you can't, it's, it's my best version of a brain. All right, so they're the last. You're like, oh, it's a brain. I had no idea what that was. Now I know it's a brain, okay? This is, sometimes people are like, why do you draw it all? I don't know. So this is my version of a brain. And here's the challenge with our brain. Our brains, study after study after study after study, and you may have experienced this yourself, Study after study after study shows that the brain is wired to hold on to negative thoughts more easily than positive thoughts. The brain will grab onto a negative thought and hold on to that thought. And the brain holds on to negative thoughts more easily than positive thoughts. It holds on to it longer and it remembers negative experiences more intensely than positive ones. I'm not making this up. If you have this, it doesn't mean you're sick. I'm not saying you're not sick. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the doctor. I'm not saying you're not well. I'm just saying that this isn't necessarily evidence because everybody's brain starts wired like this. Why? Because of the original fight or flight. We needed to take in the messages about negative things and threats that might end up killing us and killing off humanity. So we were wired this way for fear, to understand and see if there was fear, and did we need something, and were we lacking something like food that we had to go get very, very, very quickly. So we began to say, okay, how are we going to fill this fear, this need, this lack? Oh, more, 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 we need more, we need bigger things and bigger things and bigger things. But then what happens is that gets done, and we think that's going to take care of the negative thoughts and everything, and they're still there, and we're like, is that it? So let's build some more. Let's build something else. Build, 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 build. Is that it? We're still feeling that lacking. So how can we change that? We can change that by deliberately focusing on the positive. By taking prayer or other forms of deliberate discipline that increase our focus on positive things. So for example, <clears throat> if our brain tends to focus on the negative, and we have these positives around here, how can we make those positives more, how can we make them bigger? How can we make them more intense? How can we get more positive all the way around here? <clears throat> Accentuate the positive. How many people here remember that song? All right, if you haven't, it's a fun song, uh, made most popular by Bing Crosby, but it is, a, it is a wonderful song. Accentuate the positive, you know, take the negatives and put them down. But how do we do this? What magic, what sorcery does it take to do that? Like I said, there is no secret to what goes on here. <clears throat> we need to increase our focus on gratitude. We need to increase our focus on gratitude. Because the more we focus on gratitude, the stronger our brain gets wired for holding on to those positives. The more we train the brain to look more at the positives than the negatives. And the more we do that, the less we will be feeling Oh, is that it? Because we will see that it's not something else that we need, but it is something we already have. It is something that is already in our possession. It is something that is already right next to us. It is something that is already right inside of us. It is something already just right outside the window. That we can see that we don't need more, 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 build, 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 but that it's right 
there already. And so I have some homework for you. Like, no, we're just here to kind of come and get some peace for an hour and stay away from work. But no, Sunday's for Monday. We come here to be better prepared for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. I'm going to start off simple, but remember, there are three parts to this series, so we're just getting started. So what the homework is, is I want you to find 10 things every day. Just 10. 10 things every day. It can be the same 10 things. But find 10 things every day that you're grateful for. Name them. Ideally, write them down. Ideally, write them down. But if you don't want to write them down, just name them. Name them in prayer. Name them when you're driving. Name something. But 10 things each day. Because if that is where your treasure is, that is where your heart will be. And as your heart goes, will become the wiring of your brain to be able to see more of the positive that is already there. And if we begin to do that, if we begin to do these things in gratitude that we can actually use, there'll be a whole lot less of, is that it? And a whole lot more of, wow, wow, isn't this all amazing? Amen.